if you watch the news or read a newspaper or check up on things online, then you probably know that Fred Phelps died this week. Now, that name may not ring a bell for some of you, but my hunch is most of you have at least heard a little bit about what made him famous or perhaps more accurately infamous. He was the leader of the Westboro Baptist Church of Topeka, Kansas, the pseudo church known more for its controversial stances against uh, what they perceived as a permissive attitude towards what they believed to have been sin, particularly homosexuality, although not exclusively homosexuality. Their message centers around the notion that we have sinned as a nation by allowing things to which they object, such as gay marriage and abortion, and divorce, and legalized marijuana, among other things, and that because God is vengeful, we must repent and disavow those sins, or else God will ruthlessly punish us by casting us all into hell. Soldiers killed in the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan are also said to be God's punishment for our nation, national sins, as was the terror attacks of, or were the terror attacks of September 11th, and just about every other disaster, both natural and man-made. You might have seen them protesting at the funerals of American soldiers killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. Their signs bearing ugly, distasteful messages like, thank God for dead soldiers. And if you peruse their website long enough, something I'm not encouraging you to do, by the way, in doing some research for this sermon, I spent a little time digging around on their website and afterwards felt like I needed to take a shower. But if you peruse their websites long enough, you'll find that they believe God hates, hates just about everybody who isn't them. But being anti-gay was kind of their thing. It was their moneymaker, so to speak. In fact, if you do go to their website, you'll find that the address is not westborobaptist.org or wbc.com or something else like that that would actually make sense. No, the URL of their church website is www.godhatesfags.com. That's right. God hates fags. Now, you might be asking yourself why God would have it out for a bundle of sticks, which is the dictionary definition of the word fag, or why God would hate the British slang word for cigarettes. And of course, if you ask those questions, then you'd be missing out on the irony that a fully grown man who claimed to be a minister of God's word relied on middle school level insults to communicate his disdain for something he did not understand. Now, I grew up being taught that God loves everyone. John 3.16 proclaims that God so loved the world. 1 John chapter 4 reads, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. But according to Mr. Phelps and his church, God's love is not just for anybody, because God apparently hates everybody. In addition to their main webpage, you can also, they also sponsor a website entitled GodHatesTheWorld.com. I wish that that were made up, but it's not. Forget what you think you know about John 3.16 and just go to this website where you can click on the name of any one of 213 nations in the world and read a brief although in some cases rather lengthy, <coughs> America, count of why God hates that nation. Now, some of the things listed under some of those nations are legitimate. Little legitimate things to be concerned about, like human trafficking and sweatshop labor and drug trafficking. But the idea that God hates people who sin, which Scripture says is all of us, is ridiculously counter to the Bible story. Now, I don't want to tell you that God loves everything we do. Presbyterians, as good Calvinists, believe that everything we do is touched to some degree by sin, but also that God reaches out to us in love, that God's primary defining characteristics toward all people are love and compassion and mercy. You see, God loves us just as we are, but God also loves us too much to let us stay that way. So God forms us and shapes us, urging, teaching, correcting, to help us become the people that God has created us to be. 
If the Bible story tells us anything at all, it's that God is patient with people who continually screw up. Read your Old Testament and take note of how many times the people of God receive God's blessings and then practically fall all over themselves, rushing out to worship idols and break God's laws. When we sin, God doesn't just throw up God's hands in exasperation and walk away. Were that the case, God would have done that a long time ago. Now, Fred Phelps isn't the first person to make the mistake of equating his own theology with God's will, and he won't be the last. He wasn't the first one to demonize those who believe differently, either. He just did it with a certain brazen shamelessness that was both grotesque and a little sad. And with his passing, a pitiable voice of hate and ignorance has finally fallen silent. But I got to thinking about him and his philosophy as I was reading our New Testament lesson for this week. And I began to realize that this story of Jesus offering a Samaritan woman living water of eternal life speaks to just the kind of prejudice and narrow understanding of God's grace that Mr. Phelps espoused. Now, Jesus, hot and thirsty from a long journey, sits down beside the well of Jacob. The well is deep, and the only way to get water from it is to lower a bucket of some type. Now, William Barclay tells us that uh, usually travelers would carry some sort of a collapsible bucket made from an animal skin for just this very purpose. But perhaps the disciples had taken that bucket with them when they went into town to find food, or, or maybe Jesus just didn't own one of those. But either way, he was quite without a way to reach the water that was down at the bottom of the well. But there was a woman there, and she had a bucket. And she was using it to fill her jars with water from the well, no doubt to carry home for her daily duties of cooking and cleaning. According to National Geographic, even today in 2014, for millions of women all around the globe, their daily schedules revolve around the duty of traveling, sometimes a great distance, to a water source, filling heavy containers that can weigh upwards of 50 pounds or more, and then carrying those back home, and sometimes repeating that task multiple times a day. Now, for Jesus to reach out to this woman, would have been a risky affair, since it would have been very unusual for a man of his day to speak or interact with a woman in public who was not a relative of his. But that was a small issue compared to the fact that Jesus, a Jew, was talking to a Samaritan. Now you may remember that Luke tells a story about a helpful Samaritan. That story, like this one, rests on the generally negative opinion of Samaritans held by Jews of Jesus' day. You may also remember that the relationship between Jews and Samaritans was characterized by deep-seated hatred and animosity. The source of this animosity was buried deep in Israel's history from the time when Israel split into two kingdoms shortly after the reign of Solomon ended around 930 BC. The southern kingdom, which remained loyal to the kings who descended from David and Solomon, was called Judah. And the northern kingdom, which broke away to form a nation called Samaria. The Assyrians conquered that northern kingdom of Samaria in 722 BC, and many of the native Samaritans intermarried with the Assyrians and adopted their customs. For that reason, the Jews of the southern kingdom despised the Samaritans because they saw them as collaborators with the enemy, traitors to God and country, and racially impure. But their hatred of one another was about more than just petty racism. In his book, The Gospel in Parable, scholar John Donahue describes the hatred that existed between the Jews and Samaritans, noting that as the southern kingdom of Judah tried to reestablish Jerusalem after their own defeat and exile, the Samaritans opposed them. When the Jews were at war with Syria, the Samaritans sided with Syria. And in the early first century AD, Samaritans scattered the bones of a corpse in the temple in Jerusalem during Passover, defiling the temple and effectively preventing the celebration of the feast. Had Fred Phelps been alive then and had the internet been then what it is today, he would no doubt have started GodHatesSamaritans.com. That Jesus, a Jew, would speak to the Samaritan woman at all was questionable. That he would request a drink of water was downright scandalous. 
But the truly amazing part of this story is that he also offers to her the living water of eternal life. And that's the big news here in this story. There's lots of theology and interesting points and ideas to unpack, and we'll save those for another time. But today, on this third Sunday of Lent, it's enough for us to focus on the truth that Jesus offers living water to a person who to his peers and fellow Jews would have been seen at best as a person of no consequence and at worst as human scum. But that's the good news of the gospel, that God's grace is big enough for everyone, that there is the water of life for all who are thirsty, even them, whoever they are. It makes me think of God sort of like Oprah Winfrey on one of her Oprah's favorite things shows. You get some living water, and you get some living water, and you get some living water. No Oprah fans here? Okay. I imagine that when Fred Phelps got to heaven this week, there was an awkward period of transition as it dawned on him how wrong he had been for a significant chunk of his life. That as he walked hither and yon through the kingdom, he met people that we, he would have never thought would be there with him. That with understanding, there likely came some tears of regret. But I also like to think that God wrapped God's big loving arms around him and said, it's okay. My love is big enough for you too. And if we're having trouble with the idea that Fred Phelps is in heaven this morning, that may say more about how narrow is our own understanding of God's compassion and mercy and steadfast love. You see, for God's grace to be truly grace, it has to be just that radical. And for us to be changed by it, we have to be open to just how amazing is God's great love for all of us and for all of them. And that's ultimately what I think we should take away from this story today. That God's love expressed most fully in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is big enough and wide enough for all of God's people, no matter their background or their brokenness or their sinfulness, no matter how much we may hate or dislike or distrust them or they us, that the river of God's living water is deep enough and wide enough that we can all come together and drink deeply from it and be satisfied. To God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and in the world that is to come. Amen.